Hey guys, welcome to week two of Growing in Christ. Man, I hope that you enjoyed week one. And today what we want to focus on as we dive into week two is prayer. And what prayer looks like for us as a believer, for those that have a relationship with Jesus Christ and understand that He is our Savior and He is our hope. And so the scripture starts out in John 16, 24. And it says this, Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. And then it says this, Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. What an interesting verse. Because when you think about that verse, it's a really, really neat verse because it says this, until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. And so here's what it's basically saying. It's saying that until now, you may have prayed, but the problem is you didn't have a relationship with who Jesus was. And so not having a relationship with who Jesus was, the first prayer that God wants to answer for your life is not answering all your problem, but bringing salvation into your life. And so that's the first thing that God wants to do for those that don't know Jesus. But now that you have a relationship with Jesus, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Why is it important to ask in the name of Jesus? Because it's us recognizing who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. It's us recognizing that we do our part and then we leave the rest up to God. And so we do everything that we can and then we say, God, here's the rest. Now you do it. But it says this, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. See, here's the really, really cool thing about this verse. When you begin to think about this verse, I like to think about this verse like a paycheck. And you think about this check, and you've got the lines here with the money and everything on the other side. And then right down here is the authorization. Right down here is the one who can sign that check that has the authority to make that check come true. And so here's the thing. When you are asking God for what it is, and so here's what you're doing. You're giving him... The ask. I'm asking God. Now the only thing is, God is the only one who can sign that check. And so it's so cool as we begin to step back and think about this verse and God saying, hey, what I want you to do is I want you to come to me and I want you to pray. But here's the thing. When you start to look at this check, what you realize really quickly is God has not put limits on this check. God hasn't told you, here's some parameters Here's some guidelines in the way that you need to ask. Here's some guidelines in the way that you need to approach me. And so God leaves this up to you and he says, hey, here's the blank check. What is it that you need in your life right now? What is it in your life right now that you're going through that you need to say, I've done everything that I can. Now I need God to show up. And so as you need God to show up, what it is, what is it that you need him to fill in the blank right there for you? And so as you read this scripture, John 16, 24, it asks three questions. And so as a family right now, I want you to discuss these three questions. The first one is this, what is prayer? The second one is this, in whose name should we pray? And then the third one is this, what results from prayer? And so those three questions, just take some time right now as a family and answer those three questions. All right. Hey guys. Now the first question that I wanted you to answer was this. What is prayer? And here's what I want you to do is we read these scriptures and as we study these scriptures, it's important to study these scriptures with the entire Bible as our context. And so sometimes where we get in trouble when we interpret scripture is what we do is we look at one verse and then we make the Bible fit to that one verse. When really the way that we need to read scripture is we look at the Bible as a whole and then we're able to understand and see what that verse means. And so as we look at this, what is prayer? And we look through the lens of scripture as a whole, but now in this verse, what does it mean for us to pray? Well, it says, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. 
And so as we look at that scripture right here, prayer is a couple things. Prayer is communication with God. Uh, prayer is a need and a desire of us understanding that we can't and God, you can. Prayer is recognizing my need that only God can fulfill. Prayer is also a request made in the only name that can change anything. The name of Jesus. Uh, Jesus being the only one that can bring life and hope and answers to any situation and any problem that we have. And so this is what prayer is. But then also at the end, it says this, that it will make your joy complete. See, what you have to understand about joy and happiness, joy and happiness are two different things as you look through Scripture. Happiness is conditioned on your situation and your circumstances. And so a lot of times our happiness is based on, on the situation and the circumstances that we have around us. But our joy is found in something that does not change. See, joy comes from our relationship of God. Joy comes from who we are in Christ. And here's what you have to understand. That never changes. And so no matter what the circumstances around us may be, our joy is constant. Our joy is always the same. We have the joy of Christ inside of us because of who he is and what he's done for us. So what is prayer? Prayer is recognizing who we are and our need for God. And we pray and we ask, God, this is what I need. God, this is where I fall short. God, this is where I'm inadequate. God, this is where I've done all that I can do. And I need you to step in and do what only you can do. And it's praying in the right name. It's praying in the name of Jesus. It's praying through the one who gave his life so that we could have access to communicate with the Father. But then it's also recognizing that no matter the season, no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, my joy is not going to change. And so God, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. It doesn't matter what I'm facing. As I communicate and pray to you, I know that I have the joy of the Lord and the joy of the Lord is my joy strength. And so then the second question that it asks this is, in whose name should you pray? And so we've covered this a little bit, but it's in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who gives us access now to the Father. And so it was Jesus who came to the earth and he paid the price and the punishment for our sin. And so because of that, you and I now have access to the Father. And the Bible says this, that you and I should approach the throne of God with boldness and confidence. Why? Because of what Jesus has done. Jesus gives us that access. And that access is whose name we pray in now. But not only that, what results will come from our prayer? Our joy. Joy changes everything. Our relationship with our Heavenly Father gives us a joy that never changes. And so now what I want you to do as a family right now is I want you to read Matthew 7, 7 and 8. And I want you to answer this question. What does Jesus teach about prayer in Matthew 7, 7 and 8? Matthew 7, 7 and 8, verse 7 says this, Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. And so what, what is Jesus teaching right here about prayer? Well, one is this. is to keep asking, to keep knocking, and to keep searching. And when I think about this verse as a parent, this verse almost gives me anxiety thinking about this verse. Because here's the thing, how many times do you tell your kids, don't ask me again, I've already given you the answer. Stop. Don't ask me again. I've already told you. You have asked me four times and the answer has not changed. You cannot get ice cream tonight. Stop. Or how many times do they continue to knock and, and come after and, you know, come and be in just over and over or, or they're searching and they're trying to find. And as a parent that can drive the annoyance level to the very top, to the peak of what you're struggling with and what you're dealing with. 
But here's what I want you to understand about your heavenly father. He never gets frustrated with you. He never gets frustrated with you coming to him and asking. He never gets frustrated with you seeking out answers. He never gets frustrated with you knocking, knocking on the door. And saying, Jesus, let me in. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I feel distant from you. Jesus, I feel like I've run from you and I need to come back. He's not frustrated. See, the good thing about our Heavenly Father is this. He's not looking down from heaven going, Johnny, come on, you just prayed that prayer yesterday. Johnny, you just asked that yesterday. Johnny, you just said those things yesterday. And now you're saying them again so frustrated with you. I'm so tired of this. I'm so tired of you continually coming back and asking the same thing over and over. See, you no, know, our, our Heavenly Father understands our heart. And He understands that you and I struggle with a sinful nature. But what He has is His love and His compassion is greater than any frustration that He ever has towards us. And when you come and you knock and you seek and you search out who he is, man, he is so willing to open that door. He is so willing to sit down and have a conversation and explain to you. And when you continue to ask over and over, his patience and his love always endures. Isn't it good to know that when you come before your heavenly father and you pray, he is not looking down at you frustrated. See, I think for some of you, that's going to change the way that you pray. It's going to change the way you think about prayer. Because of a, a lot of us, we pray thinking as a parent. And what we do is we pray these prayers based on our emotions as a parent. And so our emotions say that we get frustrated. Our emotions say that we get tired a lot of times of the same questions. And so then our response and our prayer to God is coming from a frustrated parent. So maybe we don't go to God the same way that we should. And maybe we aren't honest with God because we feel like he's going to be too frustrated with us. But I want you to understand that your heavenly father is not frustrated with you, but that his love and his mercy and his compassion always wins out. And so I want to encourage you, go to your heavenly father, whatever it is. Listen, if you are continually going towards him and saying, God, will you please, please get a hold uh, of my kids, get a hold of my husband, get a hold of my wife. God, soften their heart, change their heart, bring them, draw them to you so that they can have the salvation that I found. He's not frustrated with that. He's not frustrated when you come before him and you say, God, I, I need you to forgive me of sin. God, I know for the past week I've asked you the same thing over and over. Forgive me of this sin. Forgive me of that sin. But I want you to know, God, I, I am so sorry. He's not frustrated at that. Your heavenly father loves you. And he loves when you come and you bring requests before him. So right now what I want you to do as a family is I want you to open up to John chapter 15. And here's some things. What are some important conditions to answer prayer? And so what is it? Is there something in order for God to answer a prayer that needs to take place? Look at that. John 15 verse 7. Talk about it as a family and we'll come right back. John 15, 7 says this, that if you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you want and it will be given to you. So here's the question that, he, that we're asking about prayer. And it says, what does Jesus teach about prayer? And so what we see right here in John 15, 7 is this. He says, if you remain in me, what does that mean? Well, the best way for me to describe this is to kind of give you a picture of a cup. And so what I want you to think as you're sitting there is picture just a glass cup. And maybe some of you have this glass cup at home um, that you can picture and you've got right there. Really good drawing. Um, and, and so you've got this glass cup. And so what does it mean to remain in Christ? Well, here's the thing. Picture Jesus... 
as the cup. And so now what we want to do is we want to picture everything inside of this cup. And so then everything that's inside of that cup. So now this is us. And so Jesus is the cup. And then we're everything inside of the cup. And as a glass cup, everything that we now see, everything that we now view, everything that we now look at, we look at through the lens of Jesus. We see through our heavenly father. And so we're not seeing life the same way that we did. We're not seeing life the way that we did before we came to Christ. But now we view it differently. Why? Because we put on the glasses of Jesus. I just got these glasses just last week. My head's been bothering me. I didn't know why. I'd gone to the eye doctor. I knew I needed glasses. I didn't think it was that bad. But then I started realizing once I put these on, how much it changed and how my view changed and how now there are things that were getting a little blurry. I've always had incredible vision, but now things have started getting blurry. And now all of a sudden I put these glasses back on and I forget how I was able to see before. And so now when I put these on, here's the thing. My view changes because of what I'm looking through. And so here's the thing. This is what the scripture is saying, is that when your view changes and you look through life in the world through the lens of Jesus, you can ask whatever you want. When you, when you pray, when you fall on your knees and say, God, I need you. When you are looking through the lens of Jesus, that request is a yes. It's a yes, period. Why? Because you're not asking anything that God does not desire for your life. You're, you're not asking out of selfish amb ambitions or motivations. You're asking with pure motives and a pure heart saying, God, I have submitted to you. I'm obedient to you. God, I'm following you in everything that I do. God, I see the world the way that you see the world. And right now, God, this is what I need from you. And so, God, I'm asking you. And God's answer is yes. Are these not incredible scriptures? How many of you for so long have been confused about prayer and praying the wrong way? But now as God begins to open your eyes and reveal what prayer actually is, it's unbelievable and it makes you want to just hit your knees and just say, God, I need you. I need you right now. And so right now what I want you to do in your homes is 1 John 14 or 1 John 5, 14 and 15. I want you to read that and let's finish this discussion right here on what are some important conditions for answered prayer. First John 5, 14 and 15 says this. This is the confidence we have approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask. And so it's saying, when I line up with who God is, remember, the cup. So when I line up with who God is, remember the glasses. When I view life through the will of God, through the desires of God. So this is what that means. That means I'm not asking out of selfish ambition. I'm not asking with unpure motives. I'm not asking in order to benefit myself. I'm not saying, God, would you grow the church and make the church just explode? And God, would you put me on TV? And God, would you put me around the world? And I'm asking these things out of a selfish ambition that then I become famous, that then everybody looks at me and says, wow, look at what Johnny's done. See, those requests are, made, are, are requests made without the right view. But if I come and make that same request and I say, God, I just, I want to be obedient and serve you no matter what. And now all of a sudden the church begins to, to grow, influence begins to grow. Why? It's because it, it was a different heart condition. See, the words that you might be speaking might be spiritual words. But if they're not spoken through the lens of the will of God, then God doesn't answer. And so what are some conditions for answered prayer? It's your heart condition. Where's your heart in all of this? Is your heart a desire? God, would you just give me a promotion? Why? 
so that you can buy a bigger house, have a bigger boat, impress more people, drive nicer cars. Because here's what you have to understand. Those things don't impress God. Those things aren't something God's looking down and God's going, oh, you drive this kind of car? Oh my goodness. Your house is how many square feet? Oh my goodness, that's unbelievable. God looks down and says, hey, how's your heart? Who are you influencing? Who are you ministering to? And when you put on the glasses and look through and see what God's doing inside of your heart, you begin to speak from that. The answer is yes. Yes. God, would you just give me influence? Yes. God, would you give me one other person to disciple? Yes. Would you give me one other person to witness to? Yes. Why? Because it's not about me. It's about him. And so when we pray, we've got to check and make sure that what we're praying, just as it says right here in 1 John um, 5.14, this is the confidence. We can have confidence, okay? I, I can walk before God boldly. Here's the thing. When we pray, I think a lot of times the way that we've been conditioned is it's kind of like if you've ever seen a dog that's been whipped and a dog that knows he's in trouble, he kind of cowers sometimes in front of the master. And I think a lot of times this is the way we approach God. Just like, God, oh, poor pitiful me, would you please just, God, in any way? And here's what First John is saying. First John's saying this. This is the confidence we have approaching God. It's this idea. Standing up boldly before God and saying, God, I know that this request that I'm making, God, I'm making this request through your will and your desire for my life. And it says this, that if we ask according to his will, we know God hears us. And if we know God hears us, then we can have the confidence that God has said yes. And so when I put these on and I come before God and I approach. And so here's the next, here's kind of the follow up with that. For some of you, maybe the request has been going out, but the answer hasn't been coming back. Maybe what you need to do is check your heart and the motivation behind those questions. And so right now, what I want you to do as a family is I want you to look up two scriptures at a time. I want you to look up Jeremiah 33, 3 and Ephesians 3, 20. And what characteristics of God is answered prayer? And so what do we see about God through these scriptures? Jeremiah 33, 3 and Ephesians 3, 20. So spend some time with your family right now and answer these questions. So in Jeremiah 33, 3, it says this, it says, call to me and I will answer and I will tell you great and unmeasurable things that you do not know. And so what do we see about God, the character of God when we pray? Well, Ephesians 3, 20 says this, now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask and think according to the power at work within us. And so God's able to do above and and beyond anything that we possibly ask or think. Jeremiah 33.3 3 says that he's going to do great and unsearchable things. See, these verses are incredible to me because I go back to my sister. When my sister was diagnosed with cancer, our family got together. And when we got together, um, I, Heather and I immediately rushed down and we drove down to Oklahoma City from Tulsa. And when we got there, we went to my sister's a hospital room and then we finally eventually went over to her house a couple days later and we were sitting there as a family and we were just praying and talking how as a family is is my sister going to approach the news that she has cancer and me being a pastor and uh, my family being the family that they are just very spiritual and grounded in the word of God um, we started just giving godly good answers and the incredible thing about all this, none of them were wrong. All of them, I mean, just spoke to the incredible character of my family, my parents and my brother-in-law and my brother and sister and my wife and just all of them. And, 
what we wanted to see God do. And one of the things that my sister said is, um, she said this, she said, I don't want my kids to be angry at God through this. I don't want my kids to be angry at God through this. She also said this, I want people to get saved through this process. And then she made another request. She said, I want to speak at my old high school and share the gospel with everybody. And for us, those were big requests. But the interesting thing about all of this and this entire process, and when you look at Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. And so there's a point to where we go before God and we are making these requests. And here's what God's saying. Your requests aren't big enough. I'm able to do more. See, you think you're asking this great and this phenomenal and this unbelievable request to where it's blowing your mind. Right now, we're in the middle of trying to build a brand new worship center. We're out of space. We're running three services and we have no room. And our kids' area is just absolutely just overpacked with kids. And we need new space. And we're praying through this request. And here's the verse that I continue to come back to just as I think about us building. is God saying, your request is not big enough. Not to him who is able to do above and beyond anything that we ask or think. And so when you lay in bed at night and you begin to dream, when you lay in bed at night and you begin to think, God's saying your dreams and your requests, they're not big enough. And the problem is your faith is holding you back from being able to do more of what God desires for you to do. Because what God wants to do and how God wants to work in and through you is more than you can even wrap your mind around. See, some of you think your influence is great and some of you think God is already stretching you and God's saying, I want to do even more than I'm already doing right now. And so as a family, we got together and we prayed and we prayed all these prayer requests. But then the interesting thing was a couple weeks later, after we had sat down with the, with the family, my sister just wanted to speak at the high school. My brother-in-law and my sister went to a Thunder game. And my brother-in-law was able to get the half-court shot. He found the guy that is able to do the half-court shot, and they talk, and he ends up going, yeah, you shoot the half-court shot. And so it started out with my brother-in-law and my sister uh, having to do a shooting competition together, where one of them had to shoot a layup, my sister had to shoot a free throw, then my brother-in-law had to shoot a three. First couple, two couples going against each other. Then one of them gets a chance to hit a $20,000 shot from half court. Well, my sister and brother-in-law make it. My brother-in-law shoots the half court shot. Boom, nothing but net. Makes it $20,000 running around, hugging Kobe Bryant and all these other people as he's running around, just absolutely stoked because it was at the Lakers game, the Lakers, his team. And um, he didn't even go over to the Thunder bench. That's a crazy thing. He ran over to the Lakers bench and hugged Kobe Bryant uh, after he made the shot. But here's the thing. As we were sitting in the living room and we began to pray, none of us began to think, God, would you let my brother-in-law hit a half-court shot? Would you let him shoot and make it? And then not after that, would you let him be interviewed by the Thunder? And then when he's interviewed by the Thunder, would you tug on the heartstrings of everybody who's watching? And would you give him the ability to then speak all around the country, all around the world, and share your message with them? Because that's what's ended up happening. My brother-in-law hit the shot. They come off to the side and the Thunder media crew huddles him up and says, Hey, what are you going to do with $20,000? Come on, so excited. My brother-in-law goes, man, we're going to... Actually, my wife just got diagnosed with cancer. And so this money will go to her fund. Literally the next day, ESPN, CNN, Fox News, ABC, NBC, CBS, Good Morning America, The Today Show, Everybody started calling like crazy and interviewing them. And for the next two weeks, they were booked up with interviews all over the country on all sorts of different stations, local, national, and worldwide. The paper in Italy ran a front page story about my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. And here's the thing. My sister wanted to speak at her high school, and she wanted to share the gospel and see people saved. In every single interview that they did, they were asking them, how are you getting through this? How are you walking through some of the hardest, most difficult points in your life? Dealing with cancer. And here's what they said. We're doing it because God is good. 
we're getting through this because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we just want to encourage everybody who's listening and who's watching that if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, listen, give your heart to him today because your hope is found in him. And when you walk through hard times and you walk through difficult times, the anchor of having your hope in Jesus is so much more satisfying than trying to walk through life on your own. And so give your heart and your life to Jesus today. All over the world. See, God wants to do exceedingly abundantly more. He wants to do more in you. Your prayers are too small. Your thinking is too small. How God wants to use you and God wants to work in your life is too small. Would you allow God to do exceedingly, abundantly more? Right now, what I want you to do is I want you to read Matthew 7, 9 through 11. And I've got three questions that I want you to think of as a family right now. And so write these down. What kind of gifts does God give his children is the first one. And then the second question is this. How do you think God will respond to a request for something he knows that would be bad for you? And then the third one is this. What do you think God would do if he knew the answer would be better for you at another time? So take some time right now. Talk about this as a family. Matthew 7, 9 through 11. Matthew 7, 9 through 11, it says this, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, you give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, you give him a snake? If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What an interesting concept as we think of this. See, the first question is this, um, when, when we look at this verse, what kind of gifts does God give his, good, his children? And so if you and I have a sinful nature, but still in spite of that sinful nature, we desire to give good gifts to our kids. Because as a good parent on Christmas, we're not sitting there with our kids and your gifts might be different than mine and mine might be different than others. But when you're sitting there at Christmas, you do the best to give your kids good gifts. It's not the price of the gifts. It's the heart behind the gifts. And you give them good gifts. And the Bible says this, that even you who are sinful, if you are a sinful person and you still desire to give good gifts, how much more then will your perfect heavenly father desire to give you good gifts? See, I think a lot of us, when we think about God, we have this misconception that when we sin, what God desires to do in our lives and in us, what God wants to do, is God wants to just give us cold. And we think of God as Santa Claus. To where when you and I mess up and make a mistake, God's gift that he's going to give us is just a big bag of coal. And so everything that we do and everything, we're just constantly wondering, this is going to be terrible. I'm going to ask for bread and God's going to give me a snake. I'm going to ask for you know this incredible piece of fish and he's going to give me a big piece of stone. And God's saying, no, 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 no. If I'm a good father, see, you have to understand that my gifts to you are good. And so the first question is this. What kind of gifts does God give his children? Good gifts. See, God always gives you and I good gifts. And so then it brings us to the second question. What do you think God would do if he knew the answer? Or what do you think God would, how do you think God would respond to a request for something that he knew was bad for you. And so think about it like this. And so your request to God your request to God your relationship with God you come before God and you say God I, I desire a, a wife. 
Not a bad request, not a wrong request, not a sinful request. But what if that person that you say, man, God, I want to marry this person. I met her in college and she just seems perfect. God, would you just just speak? God, is this is this the person I'm supposed to marry? And so all of a sudden you begin to pray and you begin to ask God. And then all of a sudden what you realize is that this isn't the right person. Not a bad request, but what does God do if the request that you ask isn't necessarily the perfect one for you? And so it's not that God's not answering your request. It's that God's looking down and God's saying, hey, I've got the right answer for you. I've got something better for you because all of my gifts are always good. What I give you is always good. And maybe, maybe this wife example isn't a good example, but maybe it's something else you're asking God and you're saying, I want to change my job. And I'm tired of my job and I'm tired of what I'm going through and I'm tired of what I'm doing all the time, every single day. And God's saying, but for you to change your job, this would be bad for you and your family. And so it's not that a job is bad, it's that this situation could be bad for you and your family. It could put you in a bad spot. And it it could put you in a spot spiritually that you're not ready for. So it turns into a bad situation. And God's saying, I only want to give good gifts. But then not only that, the last question is this. What do you uh, think God would do if he knew the answer would be better for you at a different time? See, what if your good gift that God desires to give for you is not a good gift right now? What if the good gift that God desires for you is not a good gift right now? And so what you have to begin to think and you have to understand is that when you begin to pray, it's not that God is just saying no because he can say no. It's that God might be saying now is not the right time because I want to give good gifts to you. And I want everything that I give you to be a good gift. And so if I only give good gifts and now is not the right time, and if I give a gift to you right now and it's not the right time, then it's a bad gift. It would do my son right now. I've got two boys. And one of them's 10, one of them's 7. What if I showed up to their birthday this year and I said, boys, got the perfect gift for you. I mean, you are absolutely going to love this. And I handed them a keys to a brand new Corvette. And I said, here, it's yours. This is your birthday present. Happy birthday. Dad loves you. That's not a good gift for them. Because the problem is they have to wait so many years before that gift becomes a good gift. Right now in this moment, that's not the gift that they need. Because all it would do is sit in a garage and collect dust. All it would do is sit there and not ever be able to be driven by them because they're not able to use the gift that has been given. They might be looking at me and saying, Dad, I want to... They're begging me for a Lamborghini. When I turn 16, I'm getting a Lamborghini. If I showed up at the door today with a Lamborghini, it would do them no good because they can't drive it. Can't go anywhere. It's just going to sit in the garage. And so God's looking down and God's understanding. See, my kids in this moment might not understand that that car right now is not a good gift for them. But God looks down and God understands and God knows good gifts and good timing for you. And so maybe it's not that God is saying no. Maybe it's, got, it's that God is saying no right now because now is not a good time because God only gives good gifts. And so then I want you to read Philippians 4, 6, and 7 as a family. And I want you to answer these three questions. What is the wrong reaction toward difficult circumstances Second question, what is the right response? Third question, what is the result of the right response? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Read that as a family, and let's come back together. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, 
but in every situation, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, uh, present your request to God. And then it says this, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So the first question is this, what is a wrong reaction toward difficult circumstances? Worry. Fear. Anxiety. Why? Because here's what we have to ask ourselves when we begin to think about worry and anxiety. See, the view we have to have for worry and fear is this. When worry and fear become big in our life, God becomes small. So when worry and fear is big, God is always small. What we're saying when fear and worry takes over is we're saying the circumstance and the situation that we're walking through is bigger than the God that we serve. God, I, I understand you love me. I, I understand you care about me. I, I understand you're going to give me salvation. But God, right now, me and my marriage is jacked up. And I don't know how I'm going to make it. And you begin to worry. My finances are jacked up. Yeah, God, right now we're walking through this corona and, and this virus. And God, this virus is huge and it's spreading everywhere. And, and it's going all over the place. And, and people are getting sick. People are even dying. And we begin to worry. And what we do when we worry and we live in fear, we make God smaller than the problem. And we say that this situation is bigger than God. God, I know. Like, I understand. And yeah, I, I'm trying to trust you, but I can't right now because this situation is so big. It's so huge. God, I can't do this. And all of a sudden, your worry trumps how big your God is in your life. And so what we have to do is we have to get a bigger picture of God. Because the bigger picture that we have of God, the less we're going to worry. And so when you begin to worry, what you need to do is you need to run to Scripture. Because why? Scripture is always going to give you a big picture of who God is. Scripture is always going to give you this big, massive picture and let you see how huge and how great our God is. Even from the beginning pages of Scripture. In the beginning, God created. So if God's the creator, then why are we worried? For God so loved the world. And so now all of a sudden we're getting this massive picture of who God is. And when we get a big picture of who God is, worry begins to get smaller. And so the first question that we ask right here, what's the wrong response towards worry? Fear. Why? Because we got a small picture of who God is. So in your area, here's the thing that you have to understand. Where there is fear and worry and anxiety in your life, there is a small God in your life. Where there's fear, where there's worry, where there's anxiety, there is a small picture of God in your life. Your kids. I, I don't want them to get sick. I don't want them to, you know, I, I, I don't want this to happen. I don't want that to happen to them. I need to, I, I remember us, I mean, sleeping with our hand on, on Jackson's chest when he had all these breathing issues and breathing problems and we weren't sleeping at all. And, and why? Because worry got a lot bigger than my God did. And all of a sudden, I was spending every night, I wasn't sleeping at all. I had my hand on his chest every time he just rolled over. I was jumping out of bed thinking something terrible was wrong. Why? Because worry had consumed me. And I had made God so small. And so what I had to do in that moment, in that situation, I had to make God big again. And so I literally, in my mind, just began to pray and just say, God, I can't live like this. God, I know that you are bigger than this. God, I know that you are a God in control. And so I literally, in my mind, put Jackson in my arms and I carried Jackson up to the throne of God. And I handed Jackson over to God and I just said, Jackson, God, here's my son. He's better off in your hands no matter what happens than in mine. Because God, I, I trust you. And all of a sudden, the worry began to disappear. Because my God got bigger than my worry. And when worry begins to get bigger than God again, I carry Jackson up to the throne and just say, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. You are bigger than this situation. You are bigger than this problem. And I trust you. I'm not going to spend my nights worrying because worry does nothing. 
Fear does nothing. Fear, worry, anxiety, it solves zero problems and zero issues. It does not make the situation any better. But putting it in the hands of God changes everything. And so where fear and worry are, you have a small view of God. So where is God small in your life? Where are you worrying that you need to say, God, I need you to be big because I don't want to spend my days worrying? But the next question is this. What's the right response? So it says this, do not be uh, anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, let your requests be made known to God. And then it says, in the peace of God, which passes all the will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So what is the right response? Pray. So it says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, pray. So when worry comes up, when worry starts to take over in your life, when worry starts to creep in, what do we do? We pray. God, I'm beginning to worry about this. God, this is beginning to take over. God, I don't know what we're going to do. God, I, I hear businesses are shutting down. God, I hear people are losing their jobs. God, I hear that things are not well. God, the economy is going south quick. God, I'm worried. So what do we do? We hit our knees and we pray. God, I'm not in control. And I trust you. Because I know you are greater than any worry. And so the right response to worry is to immediately turn and pray. And when fear and anxiety and worry begin to creep into your mind, what do you do? You drop to your knees and you begin to pray. And you begin to make God bigger than the situation. But then the third question was this. What response comes from it? What response comes from praying when we have worry? And so then we begin to pray. And so here's what prayer does. Prayer equals this. Prayer equals this. Prayer equals God guarding, setting up camp in front of your heart and your mind. I'm a professional artist, so I know you got those right off the bat. And so here's the thing. When I begin to worry, here's the incredible thing about this passage. Here's the incredible thing about this scripture. I begin to worry and worry begins to take over me and worry begins to consume me in everything that I'm doing and I don't know what to do. So what do I do? I hit my knees and I begin to pray. And here's what God says. God says that he's going to send peace. That passes all understanding. There should, no be, there should not be peace during this epidemic, during this corona epidemic right now that's taking place. People getting sick, they're locking things down, they're shutting businesses down, the economy's going south. And so how in the world do you and I have peace in the midst of chaos? Because we understand our source. We understand the one that's in control. And so we make God bigger than our worry. And that brings peace. But then the incredible thing is this. God will then guard your heart and he'll guard your mind. So he encamps in front of your heart and your mind. And when worry tries to come back again, and when worry tries to come in again, he's standing there and he's protecting. Why? Because where does worry set in? Worry begins with the thoughts and then settles in the heart and it starts to consume and take over. And so God says, I'm going to protect these two things so that you're not living in constant fear, constant anxiety, constant worry. And so this verse is so incredible to me because it says, don't worry about anything. Why? Because your God's bigger. Don't worry about anything. Why? Because God is bigger than any situation and any circumstance that you will ever walk through. There's not anything that you will ever go through that is bigger than the God that you serve today. And then it says this, and pray. When worry begins to come in, what do we do? We hit our knees. 
When worry begins to set in again, we hit our knees and we pray so that God becomes bigger and God gives us peace that passes all understanding. When there should be no peace, God gives peace. And then he guards our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. Incredible verses for us to hold on to today. For us to understand today. And so right now, here's what I want you to do. Philippians um, verse 7. Let's just ask this question while we're here. What results from the peace that comes through prayer? What's the result? God guards our heart and our mind. The result is God will guard our heart and our mind. And so I want you to turn over to Luke chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. What resulted when Zechariah and Elizabeth prayed for a son? What was their result? Look that up, answer that with your family right now, and we'll be right back. So as we look at this verse, Luke 1, 13 and 14, it says this. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Isn't it good to know that when you come before God, you bring your request to God? He hears you and he's listening. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done. As a child of God, he hears you and he is listening. And so he says, your prayers have been heard. And he says, your wife Elizabeth will bear a son. They couldn't have a child. They wanted a child desperately, and they'd been praying for a child. And he says, your wife will have a son. And then it says this, and you will call him John, and he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice at his birth. So he's going to be a joy and a delight, and many will rejoice. So what is the result of their prayer? Well, one, God answers their prayer. They've been praying for a son. And God answers the request that they were asking. But two is this, joy and delight. Their request, the answer for what God was doing in their life, it brings joy and delight. And then many will rejoice. Listen, it's good for people to understand what you're praying. Don't pray alone these prayers that you're going through. But get people involved so that they can pray with you so that then when the prayer request is answered, they can celebrate with you. Because it's always funner to have a party with people than it is by yourself. And some of you are praying prayers right now and you need to get others involved. You need to bring other people around. You need to get your group bigger and you need to say, hey, we're praying for this and we need God to show up in this area. Because then when God does show up and God does answer and God does show off, all of a sudden then what's going to happen? The party is going to be a lot better because there's going to be a lot more people at it. So we're going to move on to our last two scriptures. And it says this, what are some of the hindrances to answered prayer? What's a reason that prayer would not be answered? And so I want you to discuss this in your, uh, with your family right now. James 4 verse 3 is the first uh, reference. And then Psalm 66, 18. Read both of those and then let's talk about it. So here's the question that we've all been waiting for. Why will God not hear some of my prayers? Why is it that I feel distant sometimes when I pray? Why is it that when I come before God and I make these requests, well, why is it that I feel like God's not answering and God's not listening? Well, as we look at James 4, 3, it says this. It says, when you ask and you do not receive, it's because you ask with the wrong motives and that you spend what you get on your pleasures. And so could it be that your heart is not right with the request that you're giving? Just because your request may be spiritual does not mean that it's godly. 
Just because it may sound good, just because it may impress some people, does not mean that your heart and your motives behind your request are where they need to be. See, some of you may be asking for things right now, and God's saying no, because your motives in your heart are wrong. And so you're wanting God to do these things, but the reason that you're wanting God to do these things is for your fame and for your glory and for your promotion and for your finances and for your family and to get bigger and better and do and become more popular. And God's saying, "Mm -mm. no, because your motives are wrong. Or if you look in Psalm 66, 18, it says, if you had been aware of the sin in your heart, then the Lord would not have listened. Maybe for some of you, there's sin that is not confessed. There's unconfessed sin in your life right now. There's things inside of you that you know they go against the character and the nature of who God is. And when they go against the character and the nature of God without confessing those, acknowledging, God, I've chosen wrong. God, I'm sorry. I want to choose right. I want to go in the right direction. Until you acknowledge that and do the right thing, then what God is saying is I'm I'm not answering your prayers. Because there's sin in your life that you need to deal with. And so maybe today, you've got a better understanding and a better picture of who God is. And what God wants to do in your life. And how God wants to work in your life. I hope you understand how much God loves you. I hope you understand how incredible God is. I hope you understand that when you come before God. And you are looking through His lens. And making a request. You can boldly come before the throne of God. And you can make a request and God hears and God listens and God's answer and God's answer is yes. But when there's sin, you need to confess that. When the motives are wrong, when the heart is wrong, we need to get that right. And so here's the thing. My prayer for you today is that your prayer life would change through this study. That we flippantly would no longer just sit at a table and just say, hey, before we eat, let's pray. God, thank you for this food. Jesus' name, amen. Amen but that you understand you are making a request to the creator of the world, to our heavenly father, to the one who makes all the difference in the world. And when you come before him, he listens and he hears as you communicate with him. And so today, may your prayer life become different because of this study. I can't wait for you to join us next week as we dive back in, in growing in Christ, We'll see you next week. Have a great week.